right. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, just as, all, as always, we want to mention uh, on the tables in the back, there should be a, a blue softback Bible. It's our gift to you. We want you to keep that and, and read that. And so... Hey, we're in our second to last week of our Jonah sermon series. If you're new to Story Church, we preach through books of the Bible uh, as our regular diet here, just systematically preaching through uh, books of the Bible. So we've been in a sermon series through Jonah. It'll be six weeks long by the end of it, and we've titled it Boundless, which means God is boundless. He he doesn't have borders. He's not contained, and we're seeing different character traits of who God is in his infinite nature, his eternal nature, and so he is boundless in his grace. He is boundless in his kindness. He is boundless in his love. He is boundless this morning in his mercy. We're going to, hello, God's boundless mercy, God's boundless mercy. Now, uh, let's just say, uh, let's, let's do an imaginary scenario together, okay? You, use your imaginary brains with me. Let's just say you're a kid and, uh, and you and your brother and your friends get some new airsoft guns, all right? In this completely hypothetical situation, let's just say you get these new airsoft guns and your parents are home and they say, hey, we're leaving. There's two rules while we're gone. Number one, do not shoot these airsoft guns inside. Number two, if you're gonna shoot at each other, just wear a face mask. That's all we ask. These are the two rules. So in this imaginary scenario, let's say your parents take off and immediately an airsoft war breaks out inside the house. You guessed it. And let's say in this imaginary scenario, as this airsoft battle is just raging in your parents' house, uh, things break. Airsoft BBs are everywhere. And worst of all, let's just say you happen to shoot out someone's front tooth because you're not wearing masks. Now, again, completely hypothetical scenario. Let's say the fog of war dissipates. You begin to look around and see all the trouble that you instigated and all the trouble that you caused. I mean, airsoft BBs everywhere, broken things, and most importantly, a broken tooth. Now, hypothetical scenario, right? Just made up. That specificity is is just made up in my mind. This didn't happen. Um, You have two responses to this scenario. The human response, the natural response of you and I is to go like this. Uh Uh-oh, my parents can't find out. Let's try and clean this whole thing up. Have you ever tried to clean up airsoft BBs? They're, they're minuscule. I mean, they're tiny. You can't find them. And then you, let's, like, you try and gorilla glue someone's tooth back together. And, and, and you're trying to clean this thing up. Now, the reason why you're doing this, this whole thing like, oh no, no one can find out. I gotta cover this up. The reason why you're doing that is because of shame. I broke the rules. I know it. I'm busted. The alternate response that you can have is as the fog of war dissipates, you can look up and say, oh man, I gotta call dad, he can help me fix this. Friends, when it comes to the Lord in his gospel, we, just like Jonah, are lawbreakers. God has given us some very simple rules to live by. Do not take my name in vain, do not steal, do not lie, do not covet, do not commit adultery. And and, and we consistently follow the path of the flesh and and then the fog of war, the fog of our rebellion begins to dissipate and we have two responses when it comes to the Lord. Oh man, I gotta cover this up. I gotta fix this. I gotta find a way to make myself feel better about this. That's one response. But friends, the gospel call, the call of the scripture, when you sin, when you break the law of God is to go like this. I gotta talk to God, he can fix this. It's not to run from him, it's to run to him. And what we're gonna see in Jonah 3 is that exact response because God is a God of boundless mercy to his people. And his boundless mercy teaches us that when we screw up, we run to him and he gives us kindness and he gives us grace and he gives us forgiveness and he makes us whole. I mean, that's kind of the end of the sermon, let's pray. Just kidding. I know you got barbecues and stuff this weekend, but listen, God, the main point for this morning, God responds to repentance with boundless mercy. That's it. God responds to our repentance with boundless mercy. Not, oh man, I gotta cover this up. God can't find out about this. But God, I gotta, I gotta come to you. You can fix this. You can make this right. Only you can heal and restore So there's gonna be three things we're gonna look at. Jonah's message, Nineveh's response, 
or repentance and God's mercy. Jonah's message, Nineveh's repentance, God's mercy. Okay, you with me? Not distracted by an imaginary airsoft scenario? That's not the main point. The main point is mercy. First thing, Jonah's message. Jonah's message. Look back at chapter three, verse one with me. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, okay, right here, stop right there. Mercy is already jumping off the pages of the scripture to us. Here's what I mean by that. Back in chapter one, we get that exact phrase. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, and what does Jonah do? flees from the presence of the Lord, runs to Tarshish, not to Nineveh, disobeys God's commands. And God has been patient and merciful and steadfast in his love towards Jonah all through this. And the word of the Lord comes to him a second time. We have a God of second chances. We have a God of mercy. When we fail, God gives us second, third, fourth, 700 chances because he is boundless in his mercy. There is no condemnation for his children. So, so listen, as we've walked through Jonah together, you've noticed that one of my emphasis throughout this sermon series is the desire for our church and us individually to grow in holiness and to grow in obedience. Okay, that's God's will for us, that we would be sanctified. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. But what I don't want that, the, the message to get twisted into is that when I'm unrighteous, not holy, and when I'm disobedient, not obedient, that all of a sudden God's gonna cut me off and condemn me from his presence. There is a difference, friends, between consequences and condemnation. Jonah experienced the consequences of his sin the whole time, right? There's a storm. He gets tossed into the sea. He gets swallowed by a great fish, all because he's responsible for his own sin. He experiences the consequences. But at no point is Jonah cut off from the Lord. At no point does the Lord forsake Jonah. At no point does the Lord say, all right, I, I tried enough with you, Jonah. You're not mine anymore. That is not who our God is. When our God claims us to be his, we are his forever. Consequences and condemnation are different. So, so hear me, if you're a, a Christian, you've been walking with the Lord, but, but you're in a season or you're coming out of a season of rebellion, hear me. We have a rebel-loving, rebel-forgiving, rebel-restoring God. That is who he is. He does not cut you off from his presence. So Jonah already is experiencing mercy from our God of second chances. Look at verse two with me. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I will tell you. So he gets recommissioned. Same thing from chapter one, verse two. Go to Nineveh, it's a great city, and I want you to preach. But there's a little twist here. In chapter one, he said, God tells Jonah, preach to Nineveh that their evil has come up to me and I will call out against it. In chapter three, it's preach the message that I have told you. One way to kind of render that from the Hebrew language is he, God is saying to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach to them what you have experienced from me. That's what he's saying. He is saying, Jonah, you have consistently, from the moment you were born to the moment you were called as a prophet, to the moment you rebelled, to the moment you were cast into the sea, to the moment you were swallowed by a great fish, right to this very moment, I'm calling to you a second time, you have experienced nothing but mercy from me, and I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them of that mercy. Mercy in, mercy out. Jonah says as much in chapter four, verse two. It says, Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He says, I knew this about you, God. That's why I didn't want to go there. I didn't want these, I didn't want these pagans to experience what I've experienced from me. I don't want to withhold that from them. So God is saying, arise, you've experienced that second chance from me. Now go and tell the people of Nineveh of my mercy. Jonah obeys this time. Look at verse three and four with me. 
So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah finally obeys. He, he goes to Nineveh. It's a, it's a great city. Uh, what scholars are talking about there is it, or say that there, this is being talked about there is this massive city that's walled off, holding 120,000, 150,000 people-ish. And, and so Jonah gets there, and the journey from the edge of the outer wall to the city square took him about a day's journey, a day of walking. And so he walks for about a day, gets to the city center, and he preaches. What I've talked about for five weeks now is is like kind of a lame sermon. Eight words, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But here's something I think we can learn from this. I think we can learn how our evangelism can grow to look like Jonah's evangelism here. Just because it's short does not mean it's meaningless. I actually think, okay, this is a tangent, it's not in my notes. I actually think some of us that over talk, we say a lot without saying anything at all. I think sometimes fewer words is more impactful. So what can we learn from Jonah's message that will prompt our evangelism? Let's walk through a couple of things. Jonah begins with yet 40 days. 40, 40 days is a very important number throughout the scriptures. There's a few different key events that involve the day, 40 days. And typically, most often, it is this mingling of God's judgment and God's mercy. So we go back to Noah. How long did the flood cover the earth? 40 days. And what was God doing there? He was on the one hand judging the wickedness of the world and flooding it, judgment, but giving mercy to Noah and his family. It is the mingling of judgment and mercy. While Moses is with God on the mountain receiving the law, he is up there for 40 days. The people are down in camp. What are they doing? They're building the golden calf. And God wakes, or God, God speaks to Moses in that moment and says, go down because their evil has come up before me. They're building an idol. God is saying, I'm going to judge the Israelites while Moses is receiving mercy from God. The mingling of mercy and judgment. We have Jesus in the desert for 40 days being tempted and tried and resisting the temptations of Satan. And you and I, we are tempted and tried, but we Most often don't resist the temptation of Satan, but we walk headlong into our sin. And what does Jesus eventually do? Goes to the cross and takes our judgment and we get his mercy. 40 days, the mingling of mercy and judgment. Moses, I mean, uh, Jonah is preaching this idea of God's judgment on sinners and God's mercy to his people. Now, here's what I mean by that. If you're a child of God, if you have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I already said it, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Here's what that means. The penalty of your sin, every bit of it, the wrath you deserve, the punishment you deserve, the condemnation you deserve, the separation from God that you deserve, every bit of that was given to Jesus on a cross 2,000 years ago. So that all God has stored up for you is nothing but mercy. His mercy is more. His mercy is more. His mercy is more. But hear me. If you are not a part of the people of God, if you do not call Jesus Lord and Savior, God's mercy does have an expiration date. He has been patient. He has been kind. He has been slow to anger. And every bit of that, if you're not a believer, God is drawing you to his heart, saying, I love you. I sent my son to die for you. Follow me, trust in me, turn from your sin. And he is slow and he is patient and he is kind and he is slow and he is patient and he is kind. But eventually we get justice for our sin. The gospel call is either face the justice yourself or trust in Jesus, the one who has faced justice for you. Our God is not unjust. He will not let sin go unpunished. And so Jonah is preaching that to the Ninevites. He is saying, listen, you got 40 days. Trust in Jesus. Trust in his mercy. So he's got 40 days. What we can learn from that is we gotta be real when it comes to evangelism. 
Um, I think there's times where we're afraid to be honest with those we're engaging with the gospel that there is bad news. (laughs) There is bad news, and the bad news is us. We live in a twisted world that teaches the solutions in here and the problems out there. The gospel teaches that the problems in here and the solutions up there. And we have to be honest, just like Jonah is with the Ninevites, that, hey, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you the truth of Jesus because you're actually the problem. That's an offensive message. But the gospel in of itself is offensive. The gospel in of itself teaches us that there's a savior and it ain't you, but he's available. Call upon him. Jonah is clear in his message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's really clear. I think we have to be clear in our presentation of the gospel. And then finally, Jonah is simple. He is simple in his gospel message. I think a lot of times we kind of jump to assumptions that people have when we're doing evangelistic work. Here's what I mean by that. Like, well, what do we do with the dinosaurs? We gotta talk about the dinosaurs before we talk about the gospel. What do we do with their questions about the teachings and the ideologies of this world? We've got to answer all those questions before we talk about the gospel. Friends, that is downplaying the role of the spirit in the, in the, in the work of evangelism. A simple message, eight words long, is what causes revival in the city of Nineveh, a pagan place where human sacrifice was practiced. And Jonah didn't walk in there saying like, all right, let me answer all this human sacrifice stuff first, and then we'll get to the gospel. He preaches a clear message, a simple message, and the Holy Spirit of God does the work. So friends, I want to encourage you. At the beginning of this series, we collected connect cards that had 147 names of people that we are engaging with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, preach the gospel to them. Be clear, be simple, be honest, be real, and then here's what you do. Trust the Spirit. We just talked about it last week. Jonah 2.9 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation does not belong to your gospel presentation. Salvation does not belong to you answering apologetic questions. All that stuff is really important. Don't hear me saying it's not important. It's not the main thing though. The main thing is that God is in the business of saving sinners and his chosen vessel to bring his call of redemption to this world is you and I. And so if you listed those names, Have you done this yet? Have you preached the good news to them? It's Jonah's message. Now let's look at Nineveh's repentance. This is kind of the bulk of chapter three here. Look at Jonah chapter three, verses five through nine with me. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. This is a beautiful picture of repentance. And friends, um, I think a lot of times we believe repentance is kind of this one-time thing that we do where, where where we look to Jesus and we say, he's Lord and Savior and I'm trusting him with my whole life. And yes, repentance is turning to Jesus for the sake of salvation. However, repentance is a daily reality for the child of God. We have, the Psalms say, new morning mercies. We are met new, with every day with new morning mercies to reach our everyday repentance before God, right? The, the will of God, again, is that we would be sanctified. The will of God is that we would be purged from our sin and we would grow to look more like Jesus. I can tell you this morning when I was getting ready, I did not look like Jesus. 
I'm, I'm progressively growing to look like Jesus. You're progressively growing to look like Jesus if you follow him. However, we're not there yet. So God has given us repentance as a gift to do every day, to walk in every day. And we are met every day with boundless new morning mercies. And so friends, I wanna talk for a second this morning about what true biblical repentance is and what it looks like in our lives. Okay, so first thing we see is that repentance is a gift of faith. In verse five, it says the people of Nineveh believed God. Okay, notice it doesn't say the people of Nineveh believed in God. This is not some kind of agnostic acknowledgement that there is a deity in this world, right? People everywhere believe that a higher power, whatever you want to call it, a divine thing that created and controls the universe. This is about the people of Nineveh believing the one true God and and taking him at his word and submitting to his authority and trusting in his sovereignty. This is not about acknowledging the truth of God's existence. This is about bowing knee in submission to him. They believed God. And the only way that they got there is because God gave them a gift of faith. It is the Holy Spirit of God that enlivens us and regenerates us and gives us a new existence. The Ninevites didn't get there by mustering up enough faith. It was a gift of God to them. So first, repentance is a gift of faith. Number two, repentance has godly sorrow. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth. The king and the nobles covered themselves with sackcloth, sat in ashes, issued a proclamation that says man nor beast, herd nor flock, they could not taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Let them, again, be covered with sackcloth. This is godly sorrow. This is true repentance here. Uh, The New Testament tells us there's a difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Repentance involves a godly grief and a godly sorrow. Here's the difference between worldly and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow feels sad that we experience the consequences of our sin. Godly sorrow feels sad for the sin. Okay, so hypothetical situation again here. Let's say one of your kids gets a new toy and the other kid is jealous about the toy. So the second kid gets the toy and destroys the toy because they're jealous of the first kid getting the toy. You know this happened and you go and confront the second kid. Hey, what happened to the toy? Um, And they just lie about it, right? I don't know, I didn't touch it. Like, come on, I saw you. I watched the whole thing. And then as you confront them and eventually they tell the truth to you, then you begin to give them the consequences for their actions. Hey, you're gonna, you're gonna be grounded for 30 days, you're not getting any screen time, and you're gonna, you're gonna buy your, your sibling a brand new toy out of your money. And what do they do in that moment? Oh, I'm so sorry, I feel so bad, I, I didn't mean to do it, it just happened. That's worldly sorrow. Because you bring the pain of the consequences of their sin to them. Godly sorrow is going to that kid and saying, hey, what happened to your sibling's toy? And and, and they break, I'm so sorry, I feel so bad about it. I've known it was wrong. I was afraid to come to you. Whatever comes my way, so be it. That's godly sorrow. Okay, so maybe a little less of a childish example here. Let's say uh, in a marriage, the husband commits adultery and gets found out. And the wife confronts him and says, hey, you're wrong, you're wrong. You hurt me. We're going to be separated for a while. I don't know how this thing's going to go forward. You need to move out of the house. And, and in that moment, I'm so sorry. I knew it was wrong. I did wrong. And, and, and please let me stay in the house. It's, I own this house too. Getting angry and all those kind of things and whatnot. That's, that's worldly sorrow just because you got caught. Godly sorrow confesses and says, I messed up. Whatever comes my way, I understand because I'm the one who sinned and I'm so sorry for hurting you and I'm so sorry for sinning against you. Worldly sorrow only feels grief over the consequences of sin. Godly sorrow feels grief because we're convicted by our sin. And you see that in the Ninevites. 
You see them not making excuses for their sin. You see them not trying to cover up their sin. They just put sackcloth and ash on and say, whatever comes our way, we wanna trust in God, we believe him. Number three, repentance is an actual turning from sin. J.I. Packer says, repentance is a change of mind that issues a change in life. You, repentance in of itself is a, a word that involves turning. Now I wanna be careful here, but um, over time, my time in ministry, I've counseled a, a lot of dudes who are addicted to pornography. And after a couple of years of it, I, I realize, and I kind of come to and, and say, you actually just wanna meet with me because you wanna tell me that you watched porn again and you want me to tell you there's grace for that. You, you don't actually want to, to be freed from watching it, you just wanna hear me on the other end saying there's forgiveness there. And hear me, there is forgiveness there. However, the forgiveness and grace and mercy of God is meant to compel a life of holiness, a life freed from addiction, a life looking more like Jesus. And so for repentance to be true, there needs to be an actual desire to say, I don't want that anymore. Christ will not be sweet until our sin is bitter. We must hate our sin and turn from it actively and progressively and with the help of others compelled by the grace and mercy of our God. Repentance is turning from our sin, but it's not just turning away from our sin, it's turning to God. Look at verse eight with me. But let uh, man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. They're, they're turning. We're turning from our evil way. We wanna turn from this violence that's in our hand. But where? Turning my, to a mighty God. They're, they're turning to God. That's the aim of our repentance is turning to God. We're not just turning away from a life of sin and a life of evil. We're actually turning to a God. And here's the truth. The God that we are turning to is going to give us all the things we're actually looking for in our sin. Right? Sin will provide temporary bliss. Right? Sin, let's be honest, sometimes it's fun. Okay? And if you're not able to say that, you, you, you just haven't sinned large enough. I'm not, I'm not telling you to go and sin. I'm just saying, let's be honest for a second. Sometimes it feels good to do that, right? We, we get this wicked, perverse pleasure out of slandering someone else, right? We get this wicked, perverse pleasure out of being addicted to things. And so why is it fun for us? It's fun for us because for a moment, it provides the things in our soul that we're starving for, right? Your soul is not starving for addiction and gossip and lust. Your soul is starving for joy and for a moment it provides it. Your soul is starving for peace and for a moment it provides it. Your soul is starving for hope and for a moment it provides it, but it's just a moment. And then it wears off. And I don't know about you, but I know about me. When I do that, I'm covered in shame. I feel worse than before. I can't believe it. What is wrong with me? See, when we turn to God in our repentance, he gives us those things we're actually looking for. You want peace in the midst of an anxious and worried world? Go to God, don't go to sin. You want joy that satisfies the soul forever, not just temporarily? Go to God. You want a future hope? Go to God. Your sin can't provide that for you, which is why God has given us the gift of repentance. He is convincing us in repentance that he's the better way and that he's enough. And the final thing we see here from the Ninevites is that repentance desires hope in God. Look at verse nine. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. There is no presuming upon God here. <laughs> there is no, uh, God, God, God's gonna forgive me because I'm awesome. God's gonna forgive me because I'm the, I'm the one, you know? Greatest thing since sliced bread. I got this together. No, there is a genuine, I'm gonna trust God here. I don't know what's gonna come, but my hope is in him. 
He might turn. He might give me kindness. He might give me mercy. And that's what repentance is about. It's changing our desired hope, turning to God and saying, God, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm gonna trust you. Hey, people with control issues, all of us, put your hand up. Don't do it. Um, One of the reasons that holds us back from repenting is an unwillingness to entrust our future hope to the hands of a sovereign God. You don't repent because you think you can micromanage with your Excel spreadsheet all the things in this world. Like I'm gonna control all of this, 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 and this, and I'm gonna make my future happen, and my hope is laid up in that. And I think sometimes God gives us instability in this world to show us the facade of our control. I think there's times where things just go sour in your life because God wants to show you like, (laughs) you think you got this? All right, go, go get that. Go control that. And he has given us repentance to say, your hope is not in those things. You can't control those things. I'm in control and put your hope in me. Friends, we have to, we have to change our view of repentance. I think there's a negative connotation around repentance. Like it's this horrible, sad, angry thing. It is not. Repentance is one of the primary gifts of God for his people while we're here on earth. It is our way into his presence and into his boundless mercy and into his forgiveness and into his grace. And so you should embrace it as the gift that it is. And we should cry out alongside King David, God, search me and know me. Reveal to me if there be any wicked way within me because I'm gonna come to you. God, create a clean heart within me and renew my spirit. I'm coming to you. God, give me this gift. If you want to grow, if you want to look more like Jesus, if you want to hear God's voice, if you want to walk in his presence, the road there is the road of repentance. And what happens for the Ninevites? Revival breaks out. Freed from their sin. The presence of God. Right relationship with the sovereign God of the universe. Jesus taking the penalty of their sin so they don't have to. That's what's on the other end of repentance. It's not a holy hoping for the best. It's a trusting that God is going to cause revival in our souls to break out. That God is gonna cause all the things that we're starving for in our souls to come to us through him. So what is your response to God's message of mercy? Is it shame? Oh no, I gotta hide this. God can't find out about this. I need to fix it myself. Or is it, man, I messed up. God, can you fix this for me? And he will because he is a good God who is boundless in his mercy. That's Nineveh's repentance. And and by the way, one of the reasons why we have a prayer team in the back after every sermon is because we wanna make way for that to happen. This is not, like we're not Catholic, this is not confessional, okay? This is just someone who wants to come alongside you and say, this is a good thing. Confess your sin. God will free you from that. And we just want to encourage you and teach you the love of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus and pray alongside you and hope for the best alongside you. We want to do this with you. That's why we have a prayer team back there. We want to free you up every week to go back and find God's boundless mercy prayed for you by the people here. Okay? Last thing, God's mercy. We have Jonah's message We have Nineveh's repentance and we have God's mercy. They call out to this God and say, who knows, maybe he'll turn and relent. What's gonna happen here? Look at verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, how they repented, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. (laughs) The Ninevites' desire for hope in God was met by God's kindness to them and God's mercy to them. And that's who God is. That is his revealed character and his consistent work in our world. God is in the business of restoring and reconciling and renewing and redeeming lost sinners, drawing them to themselves. So when you come to God with a posture of repentance, he does not reject you. He will not reject you. It is not in his character to reject you. 
He is a God who is boundless in mercy. So he does relent from the disaster that Jonah said would come in 40 days to them because he is boundless in his mercy. Yet you and I, hopefully, you still wonder, how could God forgive a city as wicked as this? How could a holy God look past their many and gross sins? I think we actually just need to look in the mirror and ask that question of ourselves. How could God really forgive the things that I have done? How could God really look past the sins I have committed and the pains that I have caused in this world? The answer to that question is found in God's boundless mercy. You see, when when Jonah 3 talks about the repentance of the Ninevites, the Hebrew word there is Shabbat. It describes their repentance, their turning from their evil to the goodness of God. But when the word relent is used in verse 10 of God, it is the Hebrew word nacham. That word denotes inward suffering. That word is talking about God being moved to pity that he will inwardly suffer for people. And this is exactly what the gospel teaches us. God is moved to pity by his mercy for the sad and sorry state that we find ourselves in. And so what does he do? He inwardly suffers in our, for our sake. He sends his only son, Jesus, to be the one who dies for our sake. You see, God still brought disaster. He just relented on disaster for the Ninevites. Where did the disaster go? It went squarely on the shoulders of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we trust in Jesus for the sake of forgiveness, God inwardly suffers in our behalf, which means he takes the full weight of our sin, the full weight of our wrath, the full weight of our condemnation. Jesus himself was separated from the presence of God, buried in a grave after he was beaten, mocked, tortured, spit upon, and hung from a Roman cross. He faced the disaster that you and I face so that we might have new life and forgiveness in him. Mercy does not not mean an absence of justice. It means that justice was given to someone else than us. Jesus took our justice because God was moved to pity for us. This is the heart of God for you and I. And so when he says, come to me, all who are weary, when he says, come to me, all who are contrite, when he says, come to me, all who are brokenhearted, Come to me, all who are stuck in their sins. Come to me, all who are wicked and wandering. The invitation is free. And he says, come, you get mercy. Jesus will take the justice. Remember, 40 days is a mingling of judgment and mercy. Jesus took our judgment and we got his mercy. So the call today for a variety of people, maybe You've been walking with Jesus for 25 years. You just kind of stalled out. I'm just kind of cruising along here, doing my thing, checking the religious boxes. The call is to repent. Repent and trust in Jesus. Ask him to reveal your sin and then turn from that. Don't be afraid of that. Jesus solved it. Jesus forgave us of it. Now he is actively, by his spirit, in the, in the work of ridding our lives of that, looking more like him. That's the call if you're walking with Jesus. If you walked past tense with Jesus and you're just kind of wayward and wandering right now, the call is, come on back. God is not waiting to pounce. He is like the father in Luke chapter 15 where the older son takes his inheritance early and squanders everything, the younger brother, sorry, squanders everything And when when he comes to and realizes his wandering and wayward nature, he decides, I'm going to go back home and, and maybe, just maybe, my dad will let me stay in the barn with the pigs. And as his dad sees him coming back home, he runs to him and embraces him and kisses him and throws a feast for him. If you've been wandering from the Lord, that is God's posture towards you. He is just waiting and he wants to throw a party for you. If you don't follow Jesus, hear me. God has boundless mercy stored up for you. You just have to look to him 
and trust in him. Stop trusting in yourself. Turn from that and trust in him. Don't, you don't have to get the mathematical equations right. You don't have to get the languages right. You don't have to get the words right. You don't have to clean yourself up, right? We're just a bunch of misfits in this room that don't know what we're doing, but we're stumbling forward by the grace and mercy of Jesus together. And Jesus says, come on into that. I'll solve your sin problem and give you my mercy. Just trust in him. If you do that, he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness in the very moment you trust in him. So here's what we're gonna do this morning. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make a little bit of space uh, for you to, to just reflect wherever you find yourself this morning and to think about God's boundless mercy and to bring before that boundless mercy all of your wandering, all of your rebellion, all of your disobedience and to make space to turn from those things and confess those things. And, and then at the end of that, we're gonna take communion together because we need that visceral reminder that Jesus had disaster in our place, his body broken, his blood shed. So go ahead and take some time and just silently reflect. And if you don't have communion supplies, they're on the table in the back, but um, get ready for that. We're gonna take it together. So go ahead and reflect on the kindness of the Lord. God, we confess that we are great sinners, but you are a greater savior. We confess that alongside the Ninevites, we have evil and wicked ways within us and, and we want to turn from those things. So I pray, God, you would give us the gift of your spirit to uh, enliven within our souls a desire to turn from those things and trust in you. God, I pray that by your spirit's power and, and by the truth of the gospel, you would overcome objections in this room. The, the, the hard heart that cannot believe there is a good God, would you overcome that? The, the, the apathetic heart that, that is just kind of dull and cold to the truth of your gospel, would you overcome that? The rebellious heart that thinks there's no way a God can love someone as wicked as me, would you overcome that? Would you, by your spirit, pour down upon this place and enliven with our heart, within our hearts and souls and minds a deeper and a greater desire to turn from sin and to trust in you? And would you meet us in power this morning? Would you free us from our sin? Would you give us revival in our souls and in our midst? Would you give us mercy in so mercy can go out? Would you convince us, God, that repentance is not a negative thing, but is a gift from your hand to spur us on towards greater joy, greater peace, and greater hope in you and in you alone? There are so many stories and so many struggles and so much sin represented in this room, but you are a greater God who overcomes all of those things and draws a multitude of people to yourself through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So help us, God, to see that. Help us to love that. Help us to embrace that and help us, like the Ninevites, to believe you. Pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.